I like I'm just trying to put myself back at my aunt's funeral if she was like sitting next to me or like <laughs> I, I miss you so much, Amber. I like I would I would I was already like crying my eyes out. I think that would yeah. just be too crazy for me. Yeah. You'd be like, Aunt Ava, no, thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, girl, go rest in peace. <laughs> so I don't want yeah, you sitting think- next to me. Today, we will be discussing embalming, cremation, the legalities after death, and much more with our guest, Carrie the Mortician. I feel like a lot of people just on an everyday basis don't really have conversations with morticians. <laughs> Not that they know that they're talking to a mortician, I'm guessing. <laughs> right. True. Yeah. But I mean, like, you know, you would have to have a loved one die or someone, you know, die to actually go and have a conversation. And even then, you're not really asking, you know, the the type of questions uh, that we're going to talk about today. Right. You know what I mean? So yeah, you're focused, I think, on your own loved one's death when you're typically somewhere that you're talking to a funeral director or a mortician. Yeah, totally. So how did you get started in this? Did you always have a curiosity about it or? No, my mom worked at a funeral home when I was 16 and I needed a job because I was 16 and she said, why don't you work at the funeral home? I said, all right. And that was back when use pagers and so a small town funeral director for him to be able to go to his kids activities or any do anything um the gentleman i worked for he you know he had to have somebody babysit the funeral home so it was pretty common for a, there to be someone sitting at the funeral home from 8 a.m to 8 or 9 p.m just listening to phones so the other people could kind of go about their lives and then when they got home they would take the phones at night so that when somebody died they could answer it so i Babysat at the funeral home, at worked visitations. Yep. Set up chairs, vacuumed a lot, dusted, typed with a typewriter, which most people, you know, <laughs> don't right. know how to use now. Uh, typed all the documents. And that's what I did for years, my whole high school and then through college. And did you get off- made fun of at all? A bit, but I just don't remember it. It's one of those, like, I don't have main memories of it. My I think people made more fun of me for my my name and my last name is Hurlbutt. So, you know, when a butt is in your name, I think that created more. I got a crazy last name too. So I get it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I don't remember it, but it was so long ago. And I think you forget a lot of that part of high school, or at least you hope people forget kind of some of that joking and commenting. But right. I mean, I was, I was a band nerd. I had a funny last name. I worked at a funeral home. I was just kind of there. So I, <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah, I was thinking like maybe they looked at you as kind of like a Wednesday Adams, you know, I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't gothy. I didn't dress in dark, which I don't know. Um, so I, yeah. I think I didn't fit the stereotype where if I had, it would have been my whole persona totally. where it was more just, okay, I did a weird job that most people <laughs> wouldn't so instead of like working at the pizza place or the tanning salon. I, mm-hmm. I worked at a funeral home. So, yeah. So interesting. So when you were, okay, so as a 16-year-old, you're you're in a funeral home. Obviously, dead bodies are there. Right. Do you feel, do you get scared? Do you feel like, you know, there's spirits in there from that, you know, afterlife? Do you believe in all that stuff? I believe in paranormal, that there's things that are unexplained. I have never felt that the people around me, the dead people that the funeral homes, had any presence. Mm -hmm. I have felt that the old house, because a lot of funeral homes are old homes, that the presence of the old home is where some feelings and things were happening from, but I've never felt presence from a dead person at all. Um, I always feel like the opposite uh, void of anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's why, yeah, I, I, when you're around a body, it's just such, it's a body. It's such a disconnect Mm -hmm. for me um, because of that void of presence, I think. Um, But I was never scared when I was younger. I don't remember it being weird that, Mm -hmm. that, you know, I was walking around, I would walk through the funeral home in the dark, you know, getting there in the morning or at night and never really scared of it. I'm more scared of living. I mean, the living are going to do far more to me than the dead ever would. So I'm more, I think, fearful of of that than anything else. That's so true. That's so true. And I feel like people are, would be so scared to be around dead bodies versus like actually people that are alive that can hurt them. 
Right. Um, and and, and you just don't yeah. think that way. You know what I no. mean? You're just like, like, oh my God, they're dead. This is like a taboo thing that I'm I'm terrified right. of. But they're already gone. They're just there. Right. When it's like five minutes ago, that was your mom. Why all of a sudden five minutes later, because she's dead, is it like, she's terrifying. Like she's not, it's still right. your mom. It's just her shell. I've never, I just, I've never understand, stood that mentality, I guess. And mm -hmm. I, I just can't connect with that with people, but I can see, I can see the unknown is what is scary. Right. That that's what it is more. So I actually, yeah. uh, so my favorite person on earth besides my mom, uh, was my aunt Ava and mm -hmm. she died in 2009 and she was very glamorous. Like she always, she reminded me of Shaka Khan. Like she always had like the big hair and like, you know, like the blush and the lipstick. And, you know, she was yeah. very like glamorous. And um, when she passed away, I, we went there earlier to the church and I saw her body and I was like, my aunt doesn't do her makeup like that. That's yeah. not how she looks. And I refuse to bury her you know, with all these like brown tones because she always had like red blush and everything like that. And so I did her makeup. I went in my makeup bag and I did her makeup, um, you know, for her funeral. And I, I, I didn't, I felt good about it. Like I felt like, yeah. okay, I did this for my aunt. Now, you know, she could rest and stuff. And um, I feel like I'm, um, we're going to bury her how she would like to be buried. And I remember leaving and everyone made like this, like they could not believe that I did her makeup. Like they were just so absolutely shocked. So like when you say, you know, I, I'm around dead bodies, it means it doesn't feel like anything. That's how I kind of felt. I was like, this is my aunt, but right. she's not here anymore. But like, she's still my aunt. Like I kissed her face in the casket and like, I don't know. People just made it like this huge thing that I did her makeup after like all my family and stuff like that. And they're like, Amber's crazy. Like she went in, and I'm like, I didn't find that to be crazy. I don't know. No, Is that like you were the, honoring her by, but do you hear stuff like that from herself. other people? Like they, they, they can't fathom you actually taking care of a body. Like it's just so absolutely crazy that they just, mm -hmm. they can't, uh, they just think it's, it's insane. Yeah, I, I, it's the the mentality of touching someone who's dead because of what they've learned. A lot of, I think, the thought process when it comes to funerals and dead bodies and everything is learned behavior that someone, an adult, is uncomfortable going to a funeral home, is uncomfortable with the deceased. So they then tell their kids when they bring them to a funeral, you're going to be scared and right. they're gross and they impart these thoughts. So then those kids grow up to be adults and they've thought that their whole lives. And I think that's some of it, but I would prefer if someone doesn't look the way they need to, that families would be comfortable enough to say, Hey, can I please help? Or could you please do this? Because the complaints are then later after the burial, after everything's done, when we can't fix anything, we can't correct it. We can't, make it a better experience for the family. And I would rather somebody do what you did and say, I want to fix my aunt or, yeah. Hey, can you help me do this? If you're, you know, if someone's not comfortable touching them, asking us to do it, mm -hmm. but you know, they, everyone's like, Oh, they're cold and they're hard. Well, they're room temperature, which is 20 plus degrees, more, you know, colder than living. So they're not cold. Yeah. They're not ice cold. They're just, room they're temperature. not, no. You know, so it's just, it's perception. I think a lot of it, but I wish more people would be gutsy and forthcoming and say, Hey, can we do this and fix her up different? Yeah, for sure. For sure. I couldn't let her go out like that. She no. was like, for sure. Um, so how far, so what's the timeline between the morgue and the funeral home? Because, you know, the, is it true that they say the body sometimes can still move a little bit or twitch a little bit or is that just like a full-on fo folklore oh, yeah full-on folklore they're they're not sitting up 110 percent not sitting up <laughs> no, not I sitting think everybody, up. So there's funny. so many stories like oh my gosh my uncle joe dated a girl once and her brother worked at a funeral home and the body set up and i'm like really this is the story you're no leaving? i know stood up is crazy but i'm saying like is there any a, little uh i've seen a finger move just a little bit and whether it's a nerve still or whether we're doing something that maybe hits a tendon that pulls right. something it's hard to tell 
I don't know any stories from any funeral directors. And I know a lot of funeral directors that are like, oh yeah, such and such did this. And it's like a big, big, large movement. It's just, mm-hmm. I haven't, I don't know anybody who has ever but seen that. But do you that think that's work. because there's time in between, you know, the morgue to the funeral home? Do you think that those people see it more often? I don't think so because they're not even looking at them in the morgue. So most like morgues are in hospitals typically or medical examiner's offices. Mm-hmm. And they're in a body bag, typically when they're in those scenarios. So the people that are seeing them are not physically seeing them. Right, and they're covered. A lot up of anyway. times we have to, you know, encourage them to even help us move them in the hospitals because it's the security staff or you know old, older people who are you know working security at the hospital part time or whatever it is. Right. Um, I I don't know that they do. I, if if that was happening, you would get reports from the staff on the floor or the nursing home staff that is there caring or from hospice nurses that are right there hands on Mm -hmm. in that half hour after death. That's when you would be seeing something. That's when you would have twitching movement, eye flutters, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And there's not grand reports of that. Either way, just even after, it's just not a thing. It's so funny because people talk about this all the time. Yeah. Um, I assumed it wasn't, but I, I, I definitely wanted to ask you that for the viewers yeah. because I, I feel like that I've, I've heard that so many times. I'm sure they have as well. And I'm sure there's somebody out there that has a story that might be legit, but I have never heard anyone that is really, sh- it's not like the chicken where you cut the head off and it still runs for, you know, however long it's, it's mm-hmm. not that, that type of a scenario with, with humans. Um, I'm sure there's something still neurons or something firing for a little bit. Right. I don't yeah, know. That makes know. Sense. I don't know that part for sure, but it's, it's one of those huge unknowns because we can't experience it. So we've gone you know, till we've died. So right. it's hard to know. Um, do you guys, uh, do you also do a uh, cremation? Yes. Yeah. Got you. So w- the process of cremation versus a uh, burial, yeah. right? So the burial is the uh, embalm. So let's talk about how you embalm a body. Yeah. What is the process of that? And I don't think people actually know what exactly that is. Yeah. So in a small nutshell, we sanitize the person, bathe them. We close their eyes, close their mouth. We don't sew the eyes closed. We do suture the mouth closed. um, And we use a little eye cap. It's a little plastic that has little prongs barely sticking up that just hold the eyelids closed. Um, And then we do a, we inject fluids it's mostly water acting as a vehicle to move the embalming fluids throughout the body. Formaldehyde is a gas. It's into liquid form to be able to embalm with it, goes in, preserves tissue. It's a temporary preservation. This is not meant to last forever. Mm -hmm. We are just trying to get someone preserved through the death process, you know, through decaying before the burial. So for ceremonial purposes is what it is. Mm -hmm. So as you inject the fluid, blood is going to move out because it's going into where the blood is. And so the blood comes out and then we aspirate, which means we use a trocar. It's a long um, tube. It's got a point on one side. We hook it up to um, a vacuum or a suction on the other side, insert it in the abdomen. And what we're trying to do is take out bacteria and fluids and things that are in the cavity of the chest and in the abdomen, because that's where you really start breaking down um, after death. And so we want to get that out so we can preserve that area. Mm-hmm. It takes about an hour to two hours, depending on the scenario and all sorts of different factors, but right. yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. It's not as invasive as I think people believe we, in the least amount, we would make a two, three inch incision up on the clavicle and uh, one puncture in the abdomen. And that's really the only invasiveness that there is. We are not doing the autopsy, cutting the person open, right. taking organs out. That's not what we do in bombing. We're putting people back together after an autopsy. Um, and so that would be done if you're having a public viewing. It is not a law anywhere that someone has to be embalmed. So nowhere do you have to be embalmed if you don't want to be. Uh, funeral homes do require it 
if you're having a public viewing often, because we can control how the person looks, their color, um, if they're going to purge, right, right. means fluids coming out of them. So we can control that when we embalm. So without the um, embalming, do they look kind of grayish maybe? They um, do you try to a, get, get the embalming fluid in them as quickly as possible? Right. Right. Yeah. You. The longer you wait, the more the cells in the body have broken down. So we want to, or the, you know, all of the body is starting to break down. So the sooner we embalm, the sooner we can get good preservation, good distribution. Right. And that's what we want. We want to get some color back because if someone dies and they're delaying there, they're going to get pale first because of gravity. All your blood is going to move right. to your back. So you get pale. We want to return some of that coloring to somebody um, for the viewing and we want to preserve, we want to get facial features in place where we want them. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of what we're doing with that. You know, some states do require it if it's past a certain period of time or if you're not buried or cremated within a certain period of time. You don't have to be embalmed prior to cremation. I get that question all the time mm -hmm. and you don't have to be, it's not a requirement. And so... Yeah, that's, I guess, an embalming in a nutshell. And then we dress and cosmetize and put them in the caskets and everything. Right. Are, do you guys dictate a closed casket or is that up to the family? So in the end, it's really the funeral home can control how they want their business to be represented. Mm -hmm. So they can tell the family no, but that family can call a different funeral home. They can move their loved one at any time. It's mm -hmm. your loved one always that you're in control of. So if you want to see them, by all means, you can if the funeral home allows you. So what do you mean by reputation? People will frown upon that if you will allow an open casket for someone that essentially got mutilated or... Yeah, because the public doesn't know why the person looks that way always. And say they've been deceased for a few days. And yeah. we do our best embalming. They're not going to look like themselves mm -hmm. at all. We can make them look presentable. We can look that, make them look much better than they did in when they died, mm -hmm. but to the people coming in, they don't know what we started with. And so I actually just recorded some videos on this. That's funny because people believe it's a bad embalming when really the embalmer did really good for what they had to work with. Right. But it's not you can show it, put a eight by 10 beforehand photo up by the casket and go, see, they look way better. So if we present someone that is discolored, um, disfigured, swollen, anything, mm -hmm. it looks bad on the funeral home because right. the public doesn't know. And that's kind of a hard thing. We can't control their perception, but we can control what we present. I get that. That that actually yeah. makes sense. Um, have you ever gotten a body that was really, really bad, like r w worse than you've ever seen? And um, have to tell the family, like, there's there's nothing I can do with this. You know, I can't I can't really help this process or do, can you do you have the techniques to kind of maybe figure it out to do give them a, a open casket funeral? Yeah, it depends on the scenario. So let's say kind of two ends of the spectrum is one, the person has been dead for so long or was in specific conditions, um, had someone who had been in a plane crash down in Florida, super humid, super, you know, just a terrible scenario for after death and they had to remain in the plane for an extended period of time so it wasn't like they were recovered quickly gotten into a cold environment so they had outdoor animal activity exposure and everything by the time that they were received into the medical examiner's office they were so far gone there wasn't really anything they could do and then by the time they got to us in michigan their condition was just deplorable that they were in two body bags, just trying to control the smell. And unfortunately you can't expose that in the funeral home because the whole building gets permeated by that scent right. and it affects everybody, other families you're serving. So that is like the worst case of when you really can't do a viewing, but de destruction in terms of like accidents or gunshots, things like that, we can do restoration. We can put people back together. They're never going to look like they did prior, but they can look recognizable and presentable at least to the family 
to see them one last time if that's what they want. Or right. you can put do a scenario where they get to see their hand or their foot or a tattoo or something that allows them to connect with the deceased to try to help their brain wrap around, this is my loved one, if right. that's what they want. Right, for sure. So when you started, when you were 16, you said your mom was already in the business. Yeah. So is there, so someone that wants to get into the business, is there like, should they try to intern for a funeral home or is there some type of schooling they can look into to kind of, um, you know, see if they, they want to pursue this career? Yes. Yeah. Working at a funeral home is the best. I always say start by shadowing. It is not a generational job anymore if you look at who's going into mortuary schools. It is first generation. Someone has interest in the business and they go to school. They've never worked in a funeral home, a lot of them. They have no exposure. And to me, that's a scary investment if you want to work in something and you have no exposure to it. Because right. A lot of people will go to a funeral, have a really good, warm, fuzzy moment because, oh, the funeral director did a good job with the body or the funeral was great. And so they want to go to mortuary school. But that is like 5% of what we do as funeral directors. So I really want students to get a good feel for what happens around the funeral home rather than just that one good moment. So I always say try and get a job at a funeral home or something connected to a funeral home, like a removal service, you know, going and bringing the people into the care of the funeral home working at a cemetery, a crematory, something like that even would be good exposure right? just to get an idea. And then yes, you do prerequisite classes. You go to mortuary college where you get your mortuary science degree. Um, and then you have to do an internship and take state boards and national boards. So it's kind of, it's a really good mix between college classes and hands-on and then boards. So it's kind of a, I think it's like a white collar, blue collar -y type thing right. mixed together, which I love. Totally. Why, yeah. why do you think um, funerals are so expensive? Is it the process? Is it just the depending on the coffin that they pick? And also versus cremation, do you feel like a lot of people that don't have a lot of money even if it's their religious belief, they're just like, just cremate my loved one because I just can't afford, you know, a whole funeral. Yeah. So funeral homes have huge overhead because of all the specialty equipment we have to have, which I know people hate. Well, I hate the word overhead. Why do I have to pay for overhead of everybody else if it's not something you use on my family? But that's how businesses run. Right. We have to have a lot of staffing at a funeral home, vehicles, all the equipment, and we're on call 24 seven every day of the year, drop of a hat. We have to be there to care for your loved ones. So there's a price to that. Um, it's not when you look at and break down each piece, it's, it's not irrational. It is a high cost. It's a huge amount, even for a simple cremation for $800. That's a lot for a lot of it people, is. It is. especially yeah. in our economy right now. Mm -hmm. But, but what you did know, it used to be? Was it maybe like $200 or... So cream, I don't like know how where... long ago was $200 for a cremation. Oh, was that my like gosh. before your time or? Oh yeah. Far before. So okay. cremation really started spiking back in 1963. Mm -hmm. um, that's when the Catholic church lifted their ban on not allowing cremation for people who are Catholic. And Jessica Mitford came out with this book called the American way of death. And it was like, this crazy like thing attacking the funeral business and um it just kind of went after and all this happened in the same year and so cremation just spiked mm -hmm. and that was when funeral homes starting to fight for that business and we kind of shot ourselves in our own feet by making it so inexpensive rather than maintaining cremation and burial at the same cost and then people could choose what they want, not based on cost. Because like you said, there are a lot of people that want cremation because of personal belief, but there's a lot of people who are driven to it just by cost, which is unfortunate. Right. With burial, we have all these costs outside the funeral home. You have the cemetery. Um, that is a huge cost on its own. The purchase, the open closing, the headstone, all of that is additional to you know, if you had cremation, totally. so it just adds up. Yeah, so it's a lot, especially heck, if you get out to, you know, like LA, it's exorbitant pricing 
for all of those things. You know, you're short on land. So things are far more expensive when it comes to cemeteries in certain areas as well. So yeah, let's, let's talk about that because um, I actually had just had this conversation with my friend. Um, So the land, what do you think there's a, a sufficient amount of time before, is it like a hundred years where you got to then say, okay, we need to kind of move these bodies for, you know, new bodies or not necessarily build over them. But what what do you think is like a, a humane thing to do with the bodies if they no longer, you know, their family's not around, everyone had died off or what do you yeah. think is a sufficient amount of time? I think that's a hard question. It goes back to, okay, when is it grave destruction to dig up a body for archaeological purposes and claim it's archaeological when you're actually disturbing someone's resting place? Like, when is that fine line? Is it a hundred years? Is it a thousand years? When is it scientific rather than, you know, destruction of, of a human? So I don't know that there's a specific answer to that. Um, If you get over to like England, let's say, or places in Europe, they lease grave spaces. And it's the ones I know of are like 25 year leases. So your family leases it, they bury your body. If you don't pay after those 25 years for a new lease, they bury someone on top of you and they change the headstone. The other body stays wow. down there. Okay. And it goes on top. Mm-hmm. So they re reuse that same space and Smart. they can reuse it two or three times for um whoever. It can either be your family if you want to keep leasing it and you can put more family members or whatnot. We here we purchase the right to a space for forever right. rather than leasing and and doing that kind of thing. We we use burial vaults and we you know, kind of maintain the the space that way. So we're not reusing as much as we could probably. Um, cremation uses this about the same amount of environmental footprint as burial. So cremation is not environmentally friendly. Really? Tell like me A lot why. of people, you're using a lot of gas, mm-hmm. a lot of natural resources. You're expelling out materials out into the air. Mm-hmm. So you're doing some destruction with that as well. You're also using a box, which they have to be cremated in, which is made from paper, which is, or wood. So you're using wood because of that. You're driving vehicles to bring the people to the crematory. So you're using resources all along the way as well. It's not a more environmentally friendly path. There are now more disposition options like alkaline hydrolysis, which a lot of people call water cremation, which it's really not cremation, but that's how a lot of people know it, Mm -hmm. that is far more environmentally friendly. And then now human composting or natural reduction that is taking place and starting, which is the most environmentally friendly um, because you don't have gases and output and then you return compost out back into nature. So that is the newest that has come along and that's going to change everything. So do people have to you know, kind of sign up for that, like as if they're an organ donor and. No, your family can choose it after you die. Mm, Uh, You just have to get to a facility that offers it. So let's say you die in California and you want to do this. They can fly your unembalmed body up to Washington, but then you're using jet fuel and all of that. So it's not, you know, you're kind of counterproductive at this point because it's not readily available right next door to everybody. Mm -hmm. But if it was, that is going to be your best um, option and your most environmentally friendly. Sure. There's a lot of things that pop up that people are like, I want to do this, or I want to be a tree, or I want to use the mushroom suit or whatnot, that they're, they're all grand ideas and they're very romanticized, but they're not all, they don't work Mm -hmm. a lot of them. And it's, it's, They're great in concept, but they don't actually do what they say they're going to do, or they don't play out the way that they should be playing out in people's minds. But it's a good idea. Everybody is starting on that. I want something natural path. And so that's the way I think funeral service is getting geared is more, a little more hands-on, a little more simple, green burials, things like that. And then they'll talk about like exactly where they're going to put the compost at that point. Yeah, okay. you can take them home. You can take the call the compost home if you okay. want to take the compost home yeah. or 
put them in your garden, make a garden out of, you know, your loved one's compost, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, so it just depends on people's comfort level, what they're looking yeah, for. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I would, I don't know. <laughs> That's a lot for me. It's like I'm growing yeah. basil and the like, you know, my loved right. one is under there. Right. I mean, it's, it's not little... under, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's very interesting. It's very, very interesting. Um, so let's say you can't afford a funeral or a cremation. What happens then? What, what happens with the body? Does that body ever get embalmed or it's just, it goes into, uh, what, what did they call that? My mom always said. Um, she like was, a pauper's field kind of thing? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it depends on how your county chooses to and your state chooses to handle indigent cases, which is what that is. Poor people, people who have no money. It's how your state chooses to. Some states do a burial in is a proper more often than not. Um, no, it depends on the area. You know, if you get into larger cities, you're gonna have far more homeless, indigent, people with no family, people with no money. Right those scenarios. Uh, we run into where maybe people don't have money and they leave someone unclaimed where that's what we call them in our areas, unclaimed individuals where no one is going to step forward and pay for them. There may be family that has wishes, but they will, they have no funds. So then the state pays for a cremation and then the family can take them home after that if they want to, because the, the state doesn't want to keep cremated remains of people if they don't have to they'd rather right. that they be in the hands of someone that could care for them mm -hmm. rather than them set on a shelf for all eternity so that's kind of their hopeful end game if they're paying for it which means the funeral home is taking in not enough to cover our expenses even so we write off as funeral homes a lot to take care of individuals it's just the balance of how it is um because there are so many people that can't afford that um it's not mm -hmm. more common than others okay. in our area it's but it is becoming more common because some of it i think is working the system mm -hmm. that if they know that someone can be cremated and they can get them back without having to pay anything they let them go through that process because they know they don't have to contribute some people just by need that's what they do others literally have nobody they died on the street. They have nobody. And right. that's what happens with them, which is, I think, terribly sad. What I love so you is said if, they 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 go to like Potter's Field or essentially. Yeah, we don't we don't bury them here. Um in our area, they're cremated. There's no Potter's they're Field. All cre here. Oh, they're all cremated now. All cremated here. Some states do have burial in um Popper's Popper's Field kind of or oh, Potter's Pop Field. Okay. Popper's potter's field potter's for field. poppers um and so it just depends on how they decide in those states to do it because Got it's it. more expensive to have to get a box and a grave and do all of that totally. rather than just cremate someone and have the cremated remains so they the Got most it. cost effective for the state is to do a cremation the only problem is it's not reversible so they have to make sure everything is in order. That way, if anybody comes along and says, I didn't want you to cremate them, they can say, you know what? We tried to contact everybody. Here's what we did, X, Y, Z. And we how long do you think that process one. is? Do they give the like give it a month, maybe a week, two weeks? Yeah, typically it's it's one to two months, I mm -hmm. would say. Um trying to think we have one person right now we're working through the process because the family's kind of abandoned them. And so um, the medical examiners who does all the kind of hoop jumping and has to prove without a reasonable doubt that there's nobody that That's can, left. Yeah. is willing to pay. Right. If they can find family that will sign for the cremation, then they at least have signatures. Right. So they do everything they can um, to try to get things in place for it so that we nobody can come along later and say, you know what, we're going to sue you because of whatever. And so they try and make sure that's not plausible down the road. Totally. They have to exhaust every option to reach they out do. to someone. They do. Yeah. yeah. Um, how often do you, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, but how often do people donate their bodies to science? Because you said you had to go to school, right? So, like, do, do yes. people donate their bodies to that so people can learn? Or 
So at the school, or is it out I, to their family? I, Sorry. Yeah. So I went. No, you're good. I went to Cincinnati um, Mortuary College, and what happens is a lot of area funeral homes. If there's a lab on site, and we had a lab on site where we did our embalmings, a lot of the area funeral homes contract with the school, and the families know that their loved ones coming to the school and is being overseen by licensed funeral directors while the embalmers are students and learning. And so they're sent over there for embalming and then sent back to the funeral home. So they're actual bodies and ones that are going to be buried and shown and, and everything. But we also did preparation of bodies for medical schools because they have to be injected and preserved. So we would do that process for donated bodies for medical school and we would get them ready. Um, I, I would say uh, maybe two or three a year out of a thousand at the one funeral home I work at. Mm -hmm. It's not a lot because we are not right next to a medical school that they would come to. If, if you live right by a medical school, there's no cost typically, and you go directly to the school. You don't go through a funeral home. So those bodies are not coming through a funeral home for us to really know how often people are going there. But if they donate to, let's say, University of Michigan, which is two hours away from us, they have to pay. They have to pay for us to do all the processing and to take them there. And so it's not really a benefit to them in terms of financial because it's so far away. So we don't get as much of it, but when you live right near a school, you can go right to the school. They have an embalmer on staff who does a death certificate and everything. Mm -hmm. So we don't really know, I think, the full numbers on that because we're not, they're not coming through us. But medical school donation, I always say read the fine print. Um, we get a lot of questions or people will say, well, I had such and such condition, so they're gonna wanna study me. I'm donating my body to science. Well, that's not how it works. So when you donate your body, it goes into the general population. Only if at that one moment there is a study going on for the exact thing right. at school, are you actually studied? You're, you go into general population of cadavers. You may be... And they, they do what they want with you after that. Anything. Yeah. They can send you to crash test dummies. And you are a f human crash test dummy with cars. They can send you to trajectory practice with That's the state so police crazy. lab. Yeah. So there's there's things outside of what people believe. It is all good. We need those studies to take place. Totally. But I, yeah. People don't realize they're not solving cancer, you know, curing cancer by their donation just because they had cancer at one point. Right. And that's, I think that's the romanticized <laughs> version of what people want to believe. And that's fine. That is fine. That that's but I'm so what glad you said think. that because people should know that, you know, I think you need to. Yeah, because it's in the fine print. I think people just don't want to know the full of what it is. Just like, I, you know, if, if people knew every little step of embalming, they may not want that to happen to their loved one, but they want to have the final viewing moment. So I think it's a lot of things we do in life where... Yeah. We want the end moment, but we don't want to know all the little steps. I, I was speaking I at a class, that. I think at a high school once, and they were, we were talking about embalming and stuff. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to give you guys a Taco Bell analogy. And they're like, what? And I said, okay, if you knew how your Taco Bell food got to be in Girl, your hand, yes. would you eat it? And they're <laughs> okay. like, Ooh, probably not. And I said, but by God, I want the Taco Bell. Yes. And so I'm just going to eat it and not think about it. And I said, that's what it is, is we like the end result and we like the perception of it. And we like, you know, what it does for our family and for everybody. Totally. We just don't want to know all the little steps. And, and, and guess what? Fine. I was telling my assistant that before we started and I was like, there's certain things that I just don't want to ask because yeah. I don't want to know. Mm -hmm. I just, I am curious about a lot, you know, a lot of things, but there's certain things that I just, I just and I think do not want to know. Fine. You know, yeah. just like organ and tissue donation. Mm -hmm. There's so many people, especially funeral directors, because we see those individuals after they have given gifts yeah. and had procurement done. And so many funeral directors say, if people knew what they did to them, they would never do that. But it's the same with embalming. It's the same with cremation. Totally, it's the same yeah. With all of what we do. 
So I, th I think it's just, you know, in whoever is saying it has a different perception and it's fine because people don't need to know their loved one gave a gift. They gave their corneas, they gave a heart valve, whatever it is totally good on them yeah. that helps somebody else let them be in that moment rather than you want to tell them all the dissection or all the, whatever. They yeah. Don't they need, don't need to know that. Fine. Yeah. It's they don't fine. need to know that. Nope. It's fine. Let them carry on right. and it's okay. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, yeah. Well, I have one more question okay. uh, for animal and pet burials yeah. and cremation. So have you ever been into that? Is that a complete, is that, what would you call that veterinary uh, mortician or like? Yeah, we don't have, in our area, there's no pet cemeteries um, mm -hmm. where I am really. So the only, we don't have and pets. Where, where are you? I'm in Southwest Michigan. Okay. So I'm like two hours from Detroit, two hours ish from Chicago, um, four hours from Indianapolis. So mm. we're kind of in this little burb of every brewery that could ever exist. It, okay. It's right here. Um, it's like brewery city going on, but, um, yeah. So we just don't have a lot of that here in terms of pet. We cremate pets. The crematory that we use has a pet cremator, uh, pet retort in it mm -hmm. and handles pets, um, separate from the human. They can't be in the same. Well, I'm retort. sure. Yeah. But, um, they are pet people and I'm a pet person. Pet people are the craziest when it comes to that. Like they will spend hand over fist for their animals. They, you know, they can't afford food for the week, but by God, they want everything for the animal when it dies, when yep. it's living. It's amazing to me to see that because it's just a whole new level. Like grandma, yeah, you do a simple cremation for her, but by gosh, we want the most elaborate this for this animal. We want it. It's, it's just amazing. It's true. My, uh, my dog died a couple months ago after 14 years, 14 years oh, old. Yeah. Uh, he was a pug and I got him like this, this beautiful, um, box with like his picture and it's like all wood and has his name yeah. on the bottom and like this gold, plate and like I put it's right on my dresser so I get to see him at night before yeah. I go to sleep and everything like that but I think like people don't understand like your pets are like your your children especially if you don't have children I mean right. that's like this unconditional love that they have for you and I was I was pretty devastated okay. but I'm definitely that person like I will I will make sure he has the best of the best yeah for sure a lot of people where we are still go out back and bury their pets in their yard. You know, it's just super, yeah. um, you know, rural, rural out here. And that's what just a lot of people do. That's what I did with my last dog. He was buried, but then I had to dig him up and, and had him cremated because my parents were building where he was. So I had to disinter my own dog, which was right. super fascinating, but kind of like trippy at the same time. Um, but the cremation, I, it was weird cause I am not the biggest fan myself of cremation. Mm -hmm. I have nothing against anybody else doing it. It's just a weird thing for me. So having my dog, even though he'd been dead a couple of years, cremated was really interesting, really weird to me. Um, but then I took him. So in, uh, New Mexico, there's a place that presses and cr takes your cremated remains and makes them into stones. And so I took him and did that. So I have a box of these stones made out of his cremated remains, which is just super cool to me. You can carry them around if you wanted to. You could cast them in a lake and they're going to stay where you put them. Mm -hmm. It's just super. It's amazing what you can do now with different, with cremated remains, especially. And right. It's just so many options that didn't exist 20, 10 years ago, even really? that people can do now. And, mm -hmm. you know, diamonds and. Um, all these things that just didn't exist. Wait, what do you and mean diamonds? So you can take cremated remains and you press them into a gem. And they're different colors based on the organic material in that cremated remains. You can make, I mean, heck, anything that's carbon-based. You could take hair, you could take um, clothing, like uh, baby's clothing, and you can make something out of it for oh, you wow. to keep. You know, it's just, it's so cool. The things you can do costly, definitely some of the options, sure. but, and that's why to me, understanding that, you know, cremation is not just because somebody doesn't have a lot of money because people have a cremation 
Then they will go by the right to scatter by a tree out in a forest in these specialty places. Um, Better Place Forest is one. And they can scatter the cremated remains around that tree. And that is their tree. And they'll pay $15,000 for the rights to do that. It's not about cost. It's about doing what they want to do. Right. Maybe doing stuff in the funeral home. So I think there's a a consumer funeral home disconnect that has happened over time because there's so many other options now for people to do things, which is amazing. Yeah, no, I get that. Um, Carrie, this has been absolutely amazing and so informative. I feel like people are going to have a lot of questions. Oh, yeah. Uh, Follow up questions. Follow up questions. Yes, for sure. On YouTube and stuff like that. Thank you so much again for doing this. This is amazing. And um, take care. We'll talk soon. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Bye. That was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that was so cool. Hey. I was like, don't mention babies, don't mention decomposition, don't mention babies, don't mention. <laughs> no, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, but I, but again, it does. It leaves some space open to you know, for people to ask those questions and follow you. Yes, oh, of course. Um, huh? I have what she just said about asking her if there's anything she wants to mention, and also how she just said buying the rights. Um, did y'all talk about like how it might be illegal to just take ashes wherever you want? You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Are you down for three, like three more questions? Sure. Yeah, of course. So is it illegal to, to kind of just spread ashes anywhere? Um, yes. It is. It okay. Is. So you are only allowed to scatter cremated remains on your own property. If you want to scatter them in water or at a park or the beach, you have to get a permit and permission from the landowner, which would be the state or the county or the Coast Guard. So really, there's even a the ocean. Of, yeah, there is a lot of illegal scattering that goes on. As long as I'm not there, I tell people, then don't tell me about it because people go and scatter Oh my gosh, all over the place. Even at a cemetery, you're not supposed to scatter without permission of the cemetery because it's not your land. It'd be like walking and dumping garbage wherever you wanted to. It's the same thing in concept. Cremated remains, definitely not garbage, but to on paper, that's how it's kind of written is you can't just dump something where you it's not authorized um but it happens all the time and you can notice we my sister and i were walking down this path at this park one day and we were like oh my gosh and we stopped and there was this flower there and there was clearly cremated remains had been dumped obviously most people wouldn't be able to recognize them if they didn't know i i could because it was it's all bone shard that you can see and i was like that's so weird that someone would scatter cremated remains right here like we are walking across them if we didn't look down right they're right there it's just to me it's just it's it's odd to do that in such a public walking space but people do it all the time yeah Um, or like even like dumping it like over uh, into water but kind of like over an overpass because then the wind kind of Oh, it throws it into like people's faces. It's it's a lot. Yeah, it is not like in the movies where you open the box and they drift off into the wind. Yeah, and cremated remains are weighty. They're about a pound per cup, and cremated remains are about five to ten cups. So oh, they wow. weigh upwards eight to ten pounds in that box, and it's very granular. Looks like, and I know it's terrible, kitty litter where it's kind of dusty but granular because it's not actually ash. It's bone that has been ground down into a finer product right. so it will blow back in your face like yeah. the big Lebowski and if you dump it's going to fall kind of where you dump it and some of the dust will blow up back so it doesn't happen exactly like in the movies at all totally yeah wow okay that actually makes sense it is bone I mean essentially it's, 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 bone. it's bone yep I think it's so crazy because it's it's so like logical it's right there in front of you but people don't think about that they think it's like this this thin dust that like like you said in the movies that's what they think it's not yeah there's no it's not ash so the person is in a box when they go in the cremator but that's all burned off everything is burned off except for the 
this super porous, brittle bone, and then that's processed down so it can go in a bag and be given back by law, it cannot resemble parts of a human body. So we can't leave a skull whole. We can't leave bone like a humerus and hand it back to somebody. Right. So it has to be in the form we return it, but all that box is burned off. Everything inorganic is burned off and it's just this granular bone that's given back. So, so let me ask you a question because you just said yeah. that the skull, right? If for some reason somebody wanted their mom's skull or their dad's skull, right? They're already yeah. dead. It's proven that obviously they the kid didn't murder them for that reason. Right. Um, is that a possibility at all in the United States? I would have to look into, you know, with cremation, we can't cremate and then hand back a skull if it looks like a skull. But it would be how would you get the skull from a burial body would be, I guess, the question. Who is cutting the head off for you to get the head? And how are you cleaning it to keep the skull? I think there it's the steps leading up to you taking the skull home. That might be the bigger hurdles than just taking the skull home. Then actually the the it being illegal. Right. And right. I don't know that it is illegal. You you have the right to your loved one. We just have to prove where they are. So like right. we have a permit for burial that shows and chronicles where the person was buried. If your body is donated to science, it is a donation cream, you know, so it's all the different disposition options. I don't know that there's something against you keeping as long as it's not a health hazard. Right. So like the guy in Ohio that just had his wife for seven years in his home and they just found her when he died and the kids knew that she was there the whole time. Like that's a health oh hazard. Goodness. So that's illegal. What do you and think her body was like? Seven, was she a skeleton? Are you a skeleton at that point? So he had been applying from everything I've read and stuff I've heard that he'd been applying topically herbs and things to her to try to preserve her very mummification style where you apply essential oils and things to preserve her body i've heard that she was still recognizable as her definitely decomposed but still recognizable wow. so i don't know and I, and the kids I, were there the kids knew she was there they said it was dad had done it for religious purposes. I don't know what religion that is, but it's wild to me. Yeah, yeah. But so, you know, it's the fact that he never declared her death. And so then they have to look into, okay, how did she die? And why was she here? And what was being hid? And are we just trying to scam social security? And what, you know, kind of it opens this whole huge can totally. of why. So, you know, maybe if he had declared her death, she had gone through the process i don't I, yeah it's how do you get the head to take it home because i can't disarticulate that or head just the skeleton like i don't know like just yeah. the, just the full skeleton that they don't have to like kind of take the head off but like i i want my my wife's skeleton back essentially maybe he could have said that i don't know if that's a uh, a thing but i i definitely feel like in america it would probably be frowned upon people would think he's crazy Oh, of course. Yeah, you know? of course. Frowned upon. But, you know, there are religions and there are cultures where you take home a piece of the bone. You, like you take home a bone to keep for mm -hmm. a certain period of time. We don't allow that with cremation, but maybe with the other. But how do you get that bone? Like, where is the body going to be? Right. How are you ripping off the skin? That is the part that we can't destruct human bodies. It's illegal. So right. I can't cut the head off and give it to you because it's illegal. So I think it would be that those initial steps to get there would be the problem. Not so much. Even I'm curious. I'm going to look it up. I'm curious to see like if there's any cases of people saying, I want my loved I one skeleton. Or yeah. Something, yeah. Well, there's people who um, take home tattoos from their loved one. They cut off the skin and they frame and preserve the tattoo and they really? have it on a frame on their wall. There's a company that does that. And so there's gotta be, I'm going to look into it too. I'm going to see the laws, but I, I think it's the laws leading up to that would be the problem. Not so much just taking the skull home. Right. So I'm going to look into it too. There's gotta be some answers to it somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. Interesting though. Yeah. Joe, do you have any more questions? Yeah. Um, the, with all the advancements in technology, how does she see the funeral industry evolving in the future? 
He said, with all the technology uh, advancements, how do you see the funeral homes, um, what'd you say? The funeral industry evol evolving in the future. The funeral oh. industry evol uh, evolving in the future. You know, I just said the other day to somebody, I, with all the AI, they are so much being used now, like writing obituaries and everything with AI, you just input and they pop out stuff. I was, you know, we've got all these concerts. People actually go to concerts to watch Michael Jackson now in these holograms or however right. they're doing it. When, you know, when is that going to evolve over to showing somebody in a casket because they were compromised that they can't be shown or something. And so they put this image of them into a casket for people to have or a oh, wow. come to a funeral and we're going to have them walking around with you a la Michael Jackson style from the concert, you know, where there, there is a life person projected walking with you while you're having the funeral. That is the deceased. At some point, those things I am sure are going to take place. I think that there's no limit with technology. And mm -hmm. even if you shouldn't, it's going to be done at some point. So I can see I some of that stuff eventually that. happening. Yeah. I don't know if I would want that. I think it's it's wild, but I, like I'm just trying to put myself back at my aunt's funeral. If she was like sitting next to me, or like <laughs> I, I miss you so much, Amber. I like I would I would I was already like crying my eyes out. I think that would yeah. just be too crazy for me. Yeah, you'd be like Aunt Ava. No, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's thank like you. girl, go rest in peace. <laughs> so I don't want yeah, you I sitting think, next. You to know, me. but there's like extreme embalming, and if you would have asked people 50 years ago if that would have happened, they would have been like, no. And that's where the embalmer poses the person in a scenario like sitting at a table playing cards or drumming or up on their motorcycle, things like that. And so if you walk in a funeral home, that's going to be pretty like startling for people. If they don't know what's that's what they're walking into and they're like, dude's on a motorcycle, like what? Yeah. When they're gonna expect that they're walking in to see somebody in a casket. So I think limits are pushed and it's only a matter of time before somebody goes in a different direction to do something else wild like that. Yeah, for sure. It's it, there's so many things out there that are theoretical to do with bodies that haven't happened. And so there's gonna be new new wacky things I think that come up some will be good some won't be it's trial and error just like every industry I think too mm -hmm. yeah uh it, he has another one Joseph okay. this is about her mission moving forward anything that she wants to tell the audience that's important to her sure uh he said uh, your mission moving forward and anyone that uh, anything that you want to tell the audience mm -hmm. um that we may, may have left out or I didn't ask you my whole kind of objective, I think, with doing social media along with being a funeral director is helping consumers understand what happens. I think the fear of the unknown leads people to fear funeral homes, funeral directors, bodies and things and understanding more in a non-graphic, non-sensationalistic way helps people learn and helps people become more comfortable. I've gotten so many letters from people that have had questions answered that they've carried with them for so many years and they're finally at peace with them. Right. And so allowing people to feel confident walking in to make arrangements for their loved one or to ask the right questions or to encounter their own death with a little more peace is such a great thing. I'm not trying to, you know, solve world peace or get world peace or do anything grand, but helping a couple people along the way is my whole objective on my YouTube my social media, I answer hundreds of emails a month mm -hmm. that it's, it's nice to do. It's nice to help. Um, I teach for a more choice school. It's a lot of, a lot of irons in the fire and mm -hmm. trying to help in different ways, but it's all sure. towards something. I don't know what the big, yeah, I think you're doing a great are. job. Do Thank you. Wanna, you. Do, you're welcome. Do you want to tell them your YouTube, your Instagram, Twitter, yeah, it's Carrie the Mortician on everything except for Twitter. I never got into the Twitter. Um, I started playing around with TikTok. So that's been kind of fun. My daughter loves editing. She's 10. You know, she's like, Mom, I'll edit you some TikToks. I'm like, okay, <laughs> good, because I the don't kids know. love TikTok. Oh, it's crazy. <laughs> um, but so she just likes editing little things on CapCut or whatever. But mm -hmm. yeah, but it's Carrie the Mortician, K-A-R-I on on all the platforms and 
email and um, website are the same. So you're welcome to email with any questions or however I can help. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carrie. This is awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. That's it for today's episode. If you like it, leave me a review, share your stories, and I might just pick a few to read in a future episode. This episode was recorded at Spotify Studios in Los Angeles, California. Subscribe to I Hope They're Not Listening wherever you're listening to this podcast right now, and we'll be back with more soon.